All right, for our first topic, last week, news broke of four American teachers from a university in Iowa who were attacked and stabbed while visiting Jilin in mainland China. The reports are that 55-year-old attacker bumped into one of the foreigners and then proceeded to pull out a knife and attack the group. One Chinese bystander who tried to help was also injured. Uh, thankfully, everyone was survived and is recovering from their injuries, but video and pictures from the incident show the American teachers on the ground bleeding. Uh, those images were quickly censored in China, but can still be found from U.S. outlets. So what's what's your reaction here, Miles? Was this an isolated incident like the Chinese press is claiming, or is there more here we should know about this under the surface? I think, you know, what's really shocking about this incident is uh, is the the casual way with which this uh, vicious uh, violent crime against Americans uh, was carried out. I mean, it's just mm. for no reason. Uh, no particular uh, provocation. The guy just uh, didn't like Americans. So yeah. you, to answer your question, is this an isolated incident? Seemingly, because the Chinese government uh, may be correct statistically, yeah, violent crimes against Americans uh, is rare. That's true. But, you know, uh, when they say violent crime against Americans, and, and there is also a lot of caveats there. Number one, the anti-American propaganda in Chinese state media is a nonstop, 24-7. That fact cannot be denied. So, which you basically brings me to the question, uh, to the answer that I, I uh, observation I just had uh, uh, earlier, that is, uh, it's a very casual, it's a matter of course to attack Americans. Nobody seems to be surprised by this because it's conformed to what the propaganda is saying. So, uh, it is isolated, yes, statistically, but the, no, because it is a natural corollary to what the government has been saying. I hold the government of China as well as this criminal equally culpable for this uh, unfortunate uh, incident. Mm. There is also another uh, caveat in Chinese government uh, statement that is uh, violent crimes against foreigners uh, uh, are rare. Yes, to Americans, to Europeans, but the foreigners in China from Africa, from some other Asian countries, Japan, Korea, South Korea, and the Philippines, and India, they were routinely victims of the violent crimes uh, oh, in some of the major cities uh, against uh, black Americans in cities like, uh, like uh, uh, Guangdong for, Guangzhou, for example. Uh, it's pretty rampant. It's well documented. So when Chinese government makes this a sweeping statement, uh, you have to be very, very careful about the details. Yeah, and uh, something else that jumped out to me was one of the one of the victims who came out and was recalling what happened. They said police told us that he was unemployed and down on his luck was the excuse and the story behind it. But Miles, is it safe for Americans to visit China in general? And what does this whole thing say about the U.S. Chinese relationship? Uh, well, and how Americans whether Americans are becoming more skeptical about China is safe to, for Americans to visit China. The answer is no. Uh, so we're talking about not just about the street crimes. We're talking about state-sponsored crimes against Americans. That's systemic. China has enacted laws, has amended its Anti-Espionage Act that basically treat every American by default a suspect for espionage, for spying. Yeah. So any American go going to China can be subject to arbitrary arrest, detention, uh, most importantly, surveillance. China is the uh, very dystopian state of uh, surveillance. So they're very, very advanced in that. It, that's why their China uh, has been very actively collecting all the biometrics, uh, data, personal data of everybody in the world. Because uh, chances are, no matter where you are, you might be just uh, under the Chinese surveillance arm the moment you enter China. So that's why Americans don't go there. So if you look at the State Department the advisor, travel advisory website today, you will see the State Department, U.S. government official adv travel advisory for Americans going to China is reconsidered. Hmm. So there are four levels of ad advice. Number four is the level four is the word, just uh, don't go. Level three is reconsider if you have any plan to go to China at all. Despite what the Secretary General Yellen and the Secretary Romano is saying, oh, we're going to send the Americans to China, resume the terrorist uh, Haseyang past. No, it's not going to happen because the Americans, you know, we make our own decisions, right? 
So unless China changes that systemic state-sponsored crime against Americans, and uh, I don't think anybody's going to go into China. If you look at the Chinese tourist industry, the Chinese government published 2023 foreigners entering China in contrast with the 2019, which is pre-COVID. So in 2023, the difference is between 92 to 99 percent. Virtually Jeez. nobody going there. Just look at the uh, the uh, the flights between United States and China. Uh, before COVID, uh, it was about 150 flights each week. That number has dropped by 80 percent today. Uh, very few people uh, would like to go to China because it's not safe. But also, it's uh, you will be most likely to be surveyed to be uh, under Chinese um, uh, monetary system. You right. know. China realizes because tourist industry is a big major deal for the Chinese government's uh, I was revenue. Just, I was income. just going to say, is, is this having an economic impact on them at all? Oh, they are, yes. But in coming to secure, national security, uh, China has a national security paranoia. I mean, right, they right, really, right. really think everybody's go out to get them. This is not just today. This is before Xi Jinping has been always doing this. Remember, about 15 years ago, if you're a backpacker, like the most young people in the West like to backpack because it's cheap. Uh, and also you can actually go to a lot of places, see a lot of places yeah. that uh, you cannot see uh, under normal tour guided uh, delegation, right? So if you go to China 15 years ago, what guidebook would you use? You most likely you buy this, this is Australian published guidebook, which is very, very good. It's called Lonely Planet. Lonely Planet is a tourist guidebook that tells you which restaurant is very good at a particular village, which uh, hotel is really good and safe in that particular county. That was considered a national security threat. So China banned Lonely Planet. You can't make it up. Use it. Yeah, you can have it. Using the protect that Lonely Planet basically treats China and Taiwan separately. That's a different map. But that was the, that was the ruse. The real reason is because, is because China view Lonely Planet, the tour guide, as a major threat to China's national security. That's how paranoid they are. I mean, you look at the, 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 the numbers. Today, we said last, last week, there are about over 300,000 Chinese students studying in, in the United States. That accounts for about anywhere between 20, 37 to 40 percent of the entire international student body in the United States. Americans, as we speak today, in June 2024, studying in China, numbers no more than 700. 700, no zeros, that's it. 700 to 300,000. That's exactly right. So you can see the sharp difference. So to answer your question, is it safe for Americans to go to China? The answer is definitely no. Hypothetical question, maybe some practical advice from Miles. Let's say someone is going to go anyways, they're hard-headed. Miles, what would your advice to them be to keep in mind when visiting to make sure that they they can stay as safe as possible. Do it at your own risk. Mm. American Consul General will send people to visit you uh, in detention center or jail. And that's probably what we can say to you. <laughs> but just uh, just be careful. I mean, um, and don't, I think in most, most sensible Americans would know the answer, obviously. This is not a small matter. This is the small incident that highlights the fundamental difference between the United States and China. Those are two completely different systems. It operates on completely different governance and ethos. To believe otherwise is just self-kidding. Uh, we have been doing that for over half a century. Uh, we have to really, really uh, reconsider our approach to China. Not to treat China as a, any of the normal country. Normal countries can be bad, can be good. But treat China in a totally different category. It's a communist, totalitarian country with the, the mastery of the world's most advanced technologies for bad purposes. And this is the future we don't want to see uh, for the world. And you talk about people-to-people -people, uh, exchange uh, connects. Right. That's totally uh, is good. But the Chinese Communist government controls all the access and opportunities uh, for the Chinese people to freely and openly engage with the people of the world. Uh, that's why you can really cannot say there is a real genuine people-to-people -people exchange because there's always a Chinese government uh, in the middle. Moving on to our second topic, uh, we're going to bring our focus back to Taiwan, but from a different perspective than usual. 
A presidential social media exchange actually took place the other week that saw newly reelected Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi tweet directly at Taiwanese President-elect Lai ching De, saying, quote, I look forward to closer ties as we work towards mutually beneficial economic and technological partnerships. So, Miles, we've covered in past weeks how tense the relationship between China and India have become. But what's the relationship between India and Taiwan like? And what should we take away from this exchange? Narendra Modi had a Donald Trump moment. Mm. Because remember, when Donald Trump was elected president in 2016, he took a call from the yep. democratically elected Taiwanese president, Tsai Ing-wen. Yep. And that was considered controversial. China protested. All the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. freaked out. And Donald Trump asked us a very sensible question. Why is it not good, not okay, for a democratically elected president of the United States to receive a congratulatory call from the democratically elected president in a different country? Nobody could come up with a good answer because people always say, oh, there's a three communiques. This is a problem. China is very sensitive. We might get them mad. And I believe in a very broader sense, that probably is a turning point for Donald Trump to carry out his new China policy. This may be another one for India to change its tone uh, toward China. India-Chinese relationship has always been tense. People always focus on Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea. It's right. even more likely, in my view, that the first shot of a gigantic global conflagration involving China might be shot over the Himalayas between India and China because the, the tensions have been just been so incredibly uh, uh, high, particularly since June 2020, after the deadly border clash. So Modi replied to President Lai ching of Taiwan as a good uh, will congratulation note by tweeting, uh, thank you, ching Lai, for your warm message. I look forward to close ties as we work towards a mutually beneficial economic and technological partnership. It's very normal. The Chinese government just didn't like it. I and mean, they, <laughs> they came out with some very strong uh, warning against India, warning India uh, do not violate the one China principle and the India-China relationship is important. And uh, this, is, uh, this is not a very uh, normal. Uh, China acts like a crybaby again. So, and uh, of course, this gives Taiwanese government an opportunity to, to counter. So Taiwanese uh, foreign ministry said that China's outrage at the cordial exchange between the leaders of two democracies is utterly unjustifiable. Threats <laughs> and intimidation never foster friendships. And that's a pretty clear message. I think um, I, I say, you know, that's kudos good. to Taiwan. Yeah, I agree, Miles. Uh, but let's take a step back. And could you actually give me a, a better picture of India's role in global security and even regional security in the Indo-Pacific? India is a very important country. I mean, India's importance in global security has been long ignored for, for a long time, particularly during the Cold War. It had a lot to do with India's uh, independence streak and is, uh, has a very unique history. But today, when we talk about China being a, a global threat, India is a supremely important in sharing the same adversary, the PRC. Not just from the point of view of territorial disputes, as we know that India and China has the one of the world's largest territorial dispute, and the India and China have been to, uh, have gone to war for this. Uh, the most uh, pronounced uh, incident was the war between India and China in 1962. India is uh, crucial in a potential Taiwan campaign uh, if China uh, really decided to to invade Taiwan, because China cannot afford. A two-front war. India is on the western part of China. Taiwan is the east part of China. So this is something that the China has to take it into consideration. And India is also a very strong and growing partner with the United States. This is something that uh, China doesn't want to see. Even worse, India, uh, for its uh, uh, very complicated history in recent decades, since its independence, as a matter of fact, in 1947, India is also very close to Russia. During the Cold War, uh, Russia, Soviet Union provided India with its basic sort of arms equipment. So militarily, in terms of armament and uh, equipment, India is heavily relied upon Russian technology. Right. Not only that, India is a very close friend with Vietnam. Now, Vietnam is not a country China constantly loves to bully. And not only that, 
uh, for a very peculiar historical reason, India and Japan are very close right now. Uh, because uh, India is just about the only country, only meaningful country in Asia that does not have a World War II problem, entanglement with uh, Japan. You name it. I mean, South Korea, Japan, yeah. uh, South yeah. Korea, you know, Taiwan, the Philippines, Indonesia, you know, Laos, Cambodia, they were occupied by Japan during World War II. So every yeah, time you deal with there. the Japanese uh, uh, relationship, so that's one of the reasons why India-Japanese relationship is very, very strong and very powerful. Now, United States, Vietnam, and Japan are China's regional adversaries, and India is very close to all of those. Russia, of course, is also very close to India, and uh, it's good and bad, but then from the point of view of a counterbalance in China, I think uh, India's relationship with Russia is also very important because every time China buys game-changing weapons from Russia, Russia always makes sure to sell the exactly same kind of weapons, even more uh, to uh, India and Vietnam, both of whom are modernizing their weapons system against China. So you can see India is, plays a very, very important uh, role. And of course, part of the reason why India and the United States are getting closer is because Pakistan. Pakistan was a close ally of the United States of convenience during, uh, during the Cold War. But Pakistan has been playing... And Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah they're, they're basically harboring, promoting a Taliban in Afghanistan. And they're also harboring, uh, hiding Osama bin Laden, right? America's right. ultimate enemy. Most importantly, Pakistan is China's BFF. So, so right now, you have this uh, India-sponsored, India-centered coalition against China in the region and beyond. But then China completely was tone deaf to this, and it was so silly. It made some strategic miscalculations because China believed that India has an independent streak and India is therefore some kind of anti-West. So China has been actively courting India to join some of the international organizations that were within China's political orbit. Most pronounced, yeah, right. most pronounced of these organizations were BRICS and yeah. SCO, S-C-O, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So China actively is seeking India's membership. In there. Now, India now, there is a member in both BRICS and SCO. And so India can act as a meaningful check uh, to Chinese ambition and revanchism within these organizations that were controlled by China. Finally, there's one very important breakthrough when it comes to uh, United States policy. United States had this long-held doctrinal principle that it would not get involved in sovereignty and territorial disputes of countries in Asia in particular and over the world. Yeah. So for longest time, we don't say anything about you know who is right, which island belongs to whom in the South China Sea, uh, yeah. even Taiwan, we don't say that, right? But that doctrinal principle was broken over the India and China dispute. Because last year, the White House, for the first time, made a historical statement siding with India in the Chinese-Indian border dispute. That was a pretty amazing uh, statement, I would wow. say, even yeah. though people in the White House may not be aware of that. But I know, <laughs> as a historian, this is a very, very significant. So from now on, that incident can be cited as Americans uh, shift away from its uh, uh, pretense of not care about uh, this territorial disputes. All you know, India is China's worst nightmare, as China blunders by foolishly including India as an anti-Western uh, ally. India may have some of its uh, uh, difficulty with the, the, the totally Western-dominated alliance, but India is right. a democracy. You have to understand that. And India does have a very big problem with China in terms of geopolitical uh, uh, and the national security. And uh, with India being inside the BRICS and uh, SCO, I don't think India will be very happy to, 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 uh, to concede to China's leadership in yeah. many of the global organizations, um, and nor would Russia. They, they seem like a very dangerous lurking variable. 
in a lot of situations. Uh, I think you can say that. But I think I think India overall, with this uh, very robust growth in economy, with this growing confidence in its own capability to deal with the dangers like China, with yeah. this regional influence, I think India uh, potentially can be a very important uh, important uh, uh, force in reshaping global uh, geopolitics. And also keep in mind, India is considered as a leader of the non-aligned movement. And India is working really hard to get into UN Security Council as a permanent member uh, of the of the of that body. And I think you know uh, China has been monopolizing that part of the of the global representation for too long, and uh, India is not very happy with it. Yeah, I, I think the the trend of India's role in the region is going to be one we're going to be following for a long time. Uh, and to finish this off for our final topic, we've got a nice follow up to last week's discussion highlighting the global EV market. The EU must have been listening, Miles, to our episode from last week because the EU a couple days later announced plans to raise their tariffs on China's EVs. But listeners really, really should go back to the episode from June 11th for more context here. But Miles, could you give us the update from your perspective on whether this was a good step? Was it big enough to actually slow potential Chinese takeover? Or is is more going to be ultimately needed? It works is to a certain extent, but it really doesn't solve this systemic problem. Uh, that China is opposing to Europe. More realistically, the Biden administration announced uh, the imposition of a 100% tariff on Chinese EV import to the United States. That's more likely on the same scale, right? Yeah. That's why you don't see many Chinese-made EVs running around the American street and highways. EU's tariff is far less. I think it's about 25 to 30%, something like that. It's very, very minor. Yeah. It will not stop the, the Chinese uh, price advantage which basically is a completely state subsidized. China also has a very clever way to bypass all these things. Uh, they don't have to export to EU countries. All they have to do is corrupt one of the few countries right now, definitely Hungary. They set up the manufacturing bases over there. So BYD, uh, the Chinese EV company uh, leading yeah. the horse, for example, yeah. could just easily set up the plants inside the Hungary, the EU member, to make cars and uh, to basically drive around the uh, EU countries. That's one reason the EU uh, is worried about Hungary. I mean, they actually impose some kind of fine, kind of slap in the wrist uh, to Hungarians and say, uh, you're bad. You're not uh, <laughs> playing the team, uh, in the team. But I think the EU has to think twice more seriously about how to deal with China uh, as from the systemic re- uh, perspective, not just a little bit of the tariff. And most importantly, he had to clear clean up his own house.